Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're going to talk about on the cosmic mystery of Jesus Christ, or Atsumacha for short, by Maximus the Confessor. We're also going to talk about why Eastern Orthodox churches look so cool and why Protestant churches don't, and a hot outside take by me, why, for theological reasons, I prefer the Protestant churches. So if that sounds interesting, stick around, but first I want to give a little intro. So heads up, there are going to be a lot more popular patristic videos on the channel coming up. This book by Maximus the Confessor is published in the Popular Patristics series, which is a great series. They're great little books written by the church fathers, and they have cool little colorful covers. And I'm going to cover more of them on the channel. One, because I really, it's going to get more clicks. People like to know the books from the church fathers, and I can review a lot of the books I've read from the church fathers. Two is people always accuse Protestants of not reading the early church. Well, I've read a lot of the early church and I'm still a convicted Protestant. But three, most importantly, I'm going to be reviewing these books because the church fathers have a lot of great insights into scripture and about how to love Jesus more. And that's what I care about. I want to know scripture better and I want to love Jesus more. And so these books will help me do that and they might help you do that too. I wanted to start with Maximus because I've also done some videos on Eastern Orthodoxy in the past, and this is kind of on theme with that. Maximus is in like the top five Hall of Fame for most important theologians in Eastern Orthodoxy. They don't have a Hall of Fame. I think they should start one, and if they did, he would definitely be one of the first introduced. So, with all that said, ready or not, we're going to jump into Asim Machid, or whatever I said. Here we go. So Maximus was born in 580 and died in 662, and he lived the beginning of his life in Constantinople. And so those years, 580 to 662, are interesting for a few reasons. First of all, I would agree with those scholars who date the end of the patristic era to be 787. With the uh, death of John of Damascus and the Seventh Ecumenical Council, 787 is like the end of the Church Fathers era. So he's pretty close to the end. He's one of the last Church Fathers. Also, what's interesting about those years, 580 to 662, is they are uh, the same years that Islam rose. So this is the church, the first church father to write about Islam. He didn't give any like systematic theological engagement, but it's just interesting that none of the church fathers talk about Islam because it's not on the planet. It has become one of the most important movements in the history of the world, and he was the first Christian to really write about it. Also, in this years, these years, 580 to 662, the East and the West are definitely two different entities now, and Constantinople is in the East, but he's going to be exiled to the West. That will come up, and 580 to 662 is between the 5th and 6th Ecumenical Council, which is also going to be important for his biography. Maximus wrote 17 books, but most of those books are really a collection of letters or sermons that he was asked to respond to or asked to give. So like, for example, a bunch of people wrote him letters saying, hey, what does this Bible verse mean? And then his answers to explaining all of these Bible verses is collected into a book. Or a lot of people wrote him asking questions about how to interpret Gregory the Theologian or Gregory of Nazianzus. So remember, Gregory of Nazianzus, Gregory the Theologian, was 300 years years or so before Maximus, which is longer than the United States has been around. And uh, in, in Maximus's mind, Gregory is like the church father. So this guy is looking back on church fathers and Gregory is like held up in this important state. And so a lot of people wrote Maximus questions asking them to interpret Gregory and then his answers of how to interpret Gregory the theologian become some of the books. Now beyond that, we don't know many details about his day-to-day -day life in Constantinople. He seemed to be from a political family. He was well-to-do. He himself was going into politics when he became a Christian, gave it all up, went to the monastery, studied theology, and then the drama starts. There was an idea floating around in the East uh, when he started studying theology called monothelitism. Monothelitism was going to be uh, condemned as a heresy at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, but at the time it was a popular idea, and Maximus was fighting against it, and he said, no, we can't be monothelites. So what they did was they exiled him to North Africa. 
Now, this gets back to why the East and West split is important. West Africa used to be a place of great theolo theology and culture. It's where Tertullian was, and then Cyprian, and then Augustine. But by this time, because the East and West are split and the West has been declining, he seemed to go to a place that was pretty desolate, uneducated, and he was just kicked out of the country. But he continues to defend a correct Orthodox view of who Jesus was. He ends up getting his tongue ripped out and his right hand chopped off so that he can't speak heresy and he can't write heresy anymore, even though officially what he was preaching and writing about became defined as orthodoxy at the Sixth Ecumenical Council. The Sixth Ecumenical Council was in 680, and he died in 662. I think he had his tongue ripped out in 660. So after his tongue ripped out, he lived two more years, and then 20 years later, the whole church said, oh, uh, by the way, you were right. Sorry, we ripped your tongue out. So that's really all the biographical information that matters. Before jumping into Atsumacha, by the way, or whatever I called it, I do want to talk a little bit about monothelitism. This is the doctrine that Maximus fought against, and he got his tongue ripped out for it, so we should at least understand what it is. Monothelitism is, I explain it, as the fourth heresy in a list of four heresies that all make the same heart mistake. All four of these heresies have the heart of wanting to elevate Jesus as God, wanting to have him be above us, but in so doing, these four heresies end up saying he's not really human. He's not fully human. He doesn't incarnate himself into the depths of what it means to be human. And so actually it was Gregory the theologian, Gregory of Nazianzus, the one who was considered a church father by the other church fathers. Gregory of Nazianzus, he came up with this phrase, that which is unassumed is unhealed. Whatever Jesus doesn't assume into himself, that part of us isn't saved by Jesus. All of it has to be assumed for all of it to be healed. Well, anyways, the first heresy that kind of denies this is the most egregious. It's called docetism, which says Jesus didn't have a physical body. Jesus was just a ghost. And so the docetics had this cute little phrase. They would say, when Jesus and Peter were walking together on the beach, only one pair of footprints would be left. Because Peter would leave footprints, but ghosts don't leave footprints. And Jesus was a ghost. So that's the most obviously Jesus isn't fully human heresy. The second one is called Apollinarianism, which was condemned at the Council of Constantinople in 381. And Apollinarianism says Jesus had a physical body, but the seat of his emotions, his internal rational life, wasn't fully human. Fred Sanders, the Trinitarian theologian, he calls this the God in a bod heresy. He says it's kind of like Jesus had to put on a human suit to walk around on earth. You know, like humans have to put on a space suit to walk around in space. God just kind of put on a human suit and was walking around, but his internal life was nothing like our internal lives. And so then Apollinarianism leads to Jesus not assuming some part of human nature, the internal life that we have. And so that's a heresy. The third one is called Eutychianism. Eutychianism was condemned at 451 at Chalcedon. And Eutychianism says Jesus is one person with two natures, fully God, fully man. And the two natures are full, but they mix together. They become one. And in mixing them, what happens? Well, obviously, the human is wrapped up into the divine, like a drop of honey in the sea, is what they would say. The human nature is lost, like a drop of honey in the sea. Or when you look at a person standing in front of the sun, you can't see the person anymore. All you can see is the sun. Now, I know there's debate about whether Eutychius himself actually taught this, but Eutychianism says the two natures get mixed and the human is wrapped up in the divine. And so Eutychianism starts off orthodox. It starts off saying Jesus is fully human, but by mixing the two natures, he's not really like us in any meaningful sense. Okay, so that's all the backdrop for the fourth heresy that's kind of doing the same thing of saying Jesus wasn't fully human, monothelitism. And monothelitism says that, yes, Jesus had a fully human and fully divine nature. He had a body. He had an internal life. The two natures are not mixed, but both natures have the same telos. They both have the same will, the same goal. And Maximus is saying, no, well, then Jesus isn't really like us anymore. You guys are doing the same thing that the Docetics and the Apollinarians and the Eutychians did. You are in effort to try and preserve the divinity of Jesus, stealing from his humanity. And uh, here's an analogy that I've used to try and explain monothelitism in the past. It's like if I incarnated myself into dog nature, I entered the canine world, and so I had a dog body, but I continued to live with a human telos, with a human goal. I would continue to like walk on two legs and drink coffee 
and I would read books and uh, I would do human stuff. In that case, I really have a dog nature, but the telos, the goal that I'm accomplishing with my dog nature is a human telos, is a human goal. And in a deep sense, I wouldn't really be a dog. To really incarnate myself into dog nature means not just have the body, not just have internal dog thoughts, but to then do things that are pushing me towards a good dog goal. And, and uh, Maximus is saying, if Jesus becomes human, but still is only doing God stuff, he doesn't care about human ends, then he's not really a human. Jesus needs to have two natures, both fully God and fully man, including those two natural ends. Now, once you're aware of these Christological heresies, don't become the theological hammer at your local church. Conservative churches are more likely to tend into one of these heresies that dehumanize Jesus. Liberal churches tend, if they're going to fall into heresy, to be in uh, one of the heresies that take away the divinity of Jesus and his absolute moral authority. But conservative churches, for the same reason that the early church ended up sometimes speaking in a way that dehumanized parts of Jesus, modern churches churches will do this. And so I've actually had people at church uh, kind of be, kind of give lessons that are officially monothelite. There was one time there was a church lady who was kind of uh, giving her interpretation of a passage and was basically arguing that Jesus, when he was walking around in his earthly ministry, had a itinerary in his head of what he knew the Gospels Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would write down. And so he was running from place to place doing miracles in order so that the Gospels we have would be written in the correct order. It was like a time loop Bible lesson. And that's officially monothelitism. In her vision, Jesus, in his human nature, was had a completely divine end. The human Jesus walking around didn't have human ends. And in that case, it was not my place. It would not have been kind or loving to say, no, don't you understand? Maximus had his tongue ripped out to fight against that heresy. But uh, just be aware that once you're aware of these Christological heresies, if you go to a conservative church, you might hear people speak in ways that are cryptically Eutychian or cryptically Apollinarian or monothelite. And I think the way to deal with these um, is just continually point people back to Hebrews 4.15, I think is the verse that says, we have a high priest who is able to empathize with us because he was tempted in every way like we are, but he's without sin. And when it comes down to it, if Jesus wasn't fully human, if diothelitism isn't true, then not only does his cross not redeem some part of our humanity, but when you pray to Jesus, there's parts of your life that he's totally ignorant of. He can't say, oh yeah, you know what? I've been there. I know what that's like. But if Jesus is fully human, if Maximus's Christology is correct, then when you pray to Jesus, you're praying to a God who also totally gets what you're going through. That's a spiritually salient reason to hold to Christological orthodoxy. Orthodoxy. It helps your prayer life. Now, with all the Christology stuff out of the way, let's jump into Atsamacha, or whatever I called it, and talk about two central theological themes that Maximus has. The first one I agree with and think is cool, and the second one I disagree with, and it has to do with architecture. So one of Maximus's central theological ideas is this. God's intention in creation was always incarnation. Incarnation has always been God's highest priority. In the West, we might say this is how creation happened. The triune God wanted to demonstrate his glory and demonstrate his power, so he painted the universe onto a blank canvas. God created this amazing world, and then on top of that, God did this cool thing of entering into creation and becoming one of us. And Maximus would say, that's exactly opposite. You shouldn't think of creation and the glory of God as primary and incarnation as something that happened within it. You should think of the Trinity like this. This is like a super anthropological and almost childish way to put it. But maybe Maximus might say it like this. Imagine the Trinity before creation saying, we need to create something non-God. We need to create something outside of us that's empty, that's a receptacle, so we can pour ourselves into it so we can fill it up with the joy that we have and the fullness we have in ourselves. In his own words, Maximus says it this way, God, full beyond fullness, brought creatures into being, not because he had any need of anything, but so that he might participate in his creation in proportion to their capacity to hold his fullness. He created us empty that we might hold him. 
Or at another place, Maximus says, the mystery of the incarnation of the word contains within itself the whole meaning of the created world. He who understands the mystery of the incarnation and the cross and the, tr and the tomb knows the true meaning of all things. He who is initiated into this knowledge understands the reason that God created every little thing from the beginning. Okay, sure. implication of this idea of what's the most central thing in your theology? Is it atonement? Is it creation? Or is it incarnation? Is it affects the way that you articulate the faith to an outsider. And Maximus would say that starting with the incarnation is more effective because the thing our hearts long for most deeply is to be united with the God who empties himself into creation. That's why a big text for Maximus and a big text for a lot of the church fathers, but for Maximus included, is Song of Songs. He references the Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, however you say it, a ton of times. And Maximus would say that in the Song of Songs, there's almost this frustration in the drama between the man and the woman looking for each other. She thinks he's coming, but he's not there. And then he thinks she's coming, but she's not there. And they never, you never see the wedding scene full on. But Maximus would say the wedding scene happens. The beloved shows up in the incarnation. Our hearts aren't looking for getting our sins forgiven. That's helpful. Our, sin, our hearts are looking to find our beloved. We want God to incarnate himself. And so when you preach the gospel with the incarnation at the center, Maximus would say, you're answering the deepest question of the non-believer's heart. And the cross is the necessary means to the main thing, which is understanding incarnation. I don't know if I'm articulating this well at all. I guess I'll be able to tell from the dislike ratio on this video, but when he puts it, uh, when he writes it, it's more clear. So if you like something about what I'm saying, but I'm just not clear enough, then read the book. Now I want to move on to a second central idea in Maximus's theology that has been very important and formative in Eastern theology. And this idea I disagree with more. The idea is this, it's that sin is not a disordering of passions. But sin is something we did that actually introduced passions. And the idea of loving creation or being passionate or passable in God's world is bad itself. And so ultimate salvation is a fixing of the human nature so that your human nature is no longer passable. Your human nature is no longer concerned with passions for the created world. Uh, here he says it in his own words. This is page 97 in my edition. Someone, uh, Thalassius, is writing to Maximus, and Thalassius asks this question. Are the passions evil in and of themselves, or do they simply become evil when they're used in an evil way? Here I am speaking of pleasure, grief, desire, fear, and the rest. And so a Westerner would say that passions aren't evil. They become evil when you use them evilly. But Maximus says, these passions and the rest as well were not originally created with human nature. For if they would have been, then they would contribute to the definition of human nature. But following the eminent Gregory of Nyssa, I say that on account of humanity's fall from perfection, these passions were introduced, and they've attached themselves to the irrational parts of human nature. And in a different letter on page 110, Maximus says that Adam's nature was originally not liable to human passions, but as a result of the fall, we became liable. The Logos then incarnated himself into fallen human nature, taking to himself irrational passions that he might redeem our nature. So ultimate salvation for Maximus isn't a correct ordering of passions, it's a dismissal of passions. And so you might say, okay, well, in Maximus's theology, what does ultimate glorification look like? What is the end goal of his theology? And here he says it pretty clearly. It is clear that the kingdom of God the Father belongs to the humble and the gentle, for blessed are the gentle, they will inherit the earth, Matthew 5.5. 5. But it is not the physical earth, which by nature occupies the middle place in God's universe, that God promises as an inheritance to those who love him. For what man, prompted by intelligence and a wishing to serve, would ever say that from a literal reading of scripture alone, heaven and the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world and the mystery of the hidden joy of the Lord are to be identified with the physical earth? In this text, Matthew 5, 5, the word earth signifies a resolution and a strength in inner stability, immovably rooted in goodness that is possessed by gentle people. This state of stability exists eternally with the Lord and contains unfailing joy, and it enables the gentle to attain to the kingdom prepared before the beginning. And this can be clearly contrasted with the theological vision of Augustine, who is maybe the most important theologian for the West. Augustine was a few hundred years before Maximus, but Augustine says, for your gifts are good, 
for they come from you and were made by you in your goodness. Nothing in them is from us, save for sin when we neglect their rightful order. When we fix our love in the creature instead of on thee, the creator. Sin then comes from a disordered love of the good. Augustine would say ultimate salvation isn't about leaving this world. It's about loving this world, the nitty grittiness of it, and the food, and the music, and the smells, and the beauty, and even the sex of this world more deeply, but just in the right order. A reordering of passions is salvation, not a dismissal of passions. And so you can see here with these two kind of heart differences of what the goal of salvation is, one represented by Maximus, one by Augustine, that over centuries, these two theological circles might develop religious architecture differently. Mount Athos is probably the most important holy site in Eastern Orthodoxy, and it's on a mountain, on an island, away from everyone else, full of beautiful monasteries. And the goal there is to say, look, our most important holy site is on a mountain, on an island full of beautiful buildings that take you out of this world. That theologically says something about the goal of salvation through their architecture. Conversely, within Protestantism, especially within Puritan Protestantism, the goal of the church is to be no more beautiful than the buildings around it and to be right in the center of town and then to beautify the whole town. The goal of the religious architecture of the Puritans is to be right in the middle of commerce and then slowly beautify all of commerce so that the sacred, sacred and the secular are merged from the inside out. That vision of salvation is articulated in the religious architecture. And even though there's a lot of beautiful things to venerate about Eastern Orthodox ar architecture, because I'm theologically convicted of Augustine's position and the Protestant position, I actually kind of like the plain Jane Baptist Church in the middle of town more so because of its theology than the things on Mount Athos. Okay, so that's it. That's my first summary of a, patrist a popular patristic book. Hopefully this was somehow helpful for someone. If it was, I'm going to do more of these in the future. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.